boys and girls, and welcome back to my classroom today. You might notice I look a little strange today. Um, I came to school today and wanted to get in costume so that we could talk about the 18th century today, and I am setting the stage by wearing some 18th century clothing today. So before we start our lesson, I thought I would teach you the proper 18th century greeting to one another. So if you're a lady today, I'm going to teach you the way to curtsy. So you may have seen this before, but all you're going to do is stand up and you're going to put your heels together and you could lift your dress a little if you're wearing a dress or pretend and you're just going to dip ever so slightly. Now, if you're not lifting your dress, you could cup your hands here and dip just a little bit, just very small. Now, if you're a boy, you're also going to stand and you're going to bow to the lady that you are going to dance with or greet. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to put your best foot forward or your right foot and you're going to show off that calf muscle because that means that you are wealthy when you have a big calf muscle. You've worked hard and you don't do manual labor with your arms. You have a strong calf, calf muscle. So you put your foot forward with your toe kind of pointed and you just bow just a little bit with your hand out. So that's how you would bow and greet one another in the 18th century. All right, so today we're going to be talking about the colonial time period. And I am excited to talk to you about the history of that time. And we're going to make some things today. I'm going to read you a book and lots of things to share with you. Now, I'm going to take my hat off because we are inside. Now, in the 18th century, I would have worn a hat anytime I went outside in order to... Um, protect myself from the sun and the elements around, but I'm going to take that off for now, just more comfortable indoors. Now, I would keep my cap on. Um, bathing was optional in the 18th century, okay? They didn't have bathtubs like we have now, so you would want to cover your hair and keep yourself as clean as possible. That's another reason you wear a, um, an apron, is to keep your petticoat or your dress as clean as you can, because you're not changing clothes clothes you didn't have a washing machine you could just throw your clothes into at the end of each day you're going to be using those same clothes and wearing those same clothes several times so an apron was always really handy to have over your gown or whatever you're wearing now if you're a boy um you would not wear um the apron and my apron has a special little part here that we could flip up and pin and it just made it a little more dressy and it would cover up the top of my gown as well all right so today we're going to talk about the third 13 colonies. So before America was what we know it to be today, um, colonial life was very different. So like I said, bathing wasn't common practice. Um, there was no electricity. There was no television. There was no Wi-Fi or internet. And so life was very different and life was very hard. They had to work very hard for everything that they had. Um, the majority of people living in colonial America did not have a big fancy house like the ones you see here. Most are living out on a farm in a rural area. Now, now the way it came to be is um, the 13 colonies were essentially 13 states along the eastern coast of the United States. Around the 1500s, Europe decided they were going to start sending people to America to start some colonies or little towns or villages. And honestly, they started it so they could make money because Europe was filling up. They needed money to fund wars and things that they had gotten themselves into. It was a very crowded, yucky place to be at the time. So they wanted to uh, find new opportunities in America. And so they started sending people over. And the first try was, was not very successful. It's a place called Roanoke in North Carolina. And those people went over and they started a little village and they were doing really well. And the next time someone went to check on them, they were gone. They had vanished completely and nobody knows what happened to them. So that's a really interesting story to look up and do your own research on is the colony of Roanoke and what happened to them. There's lots of crazy theories out there what might have occurred. And, and then um, a little while later, the London company decided to send some men to a place called Jamestown, Virginia. And they started the first permanent English settlement that was successful. Now, when I say successful, it was rough going. It was not a fun place to be. It was dirty and nasty, and they were starving, and it was scary to be there. But 
they were successful thanks to a cash crop called tobacco. And, and that tobacco allowed them to make a lot of money. And because of that, the people begin to spread out and you can see more and more people begin being sent to America. And I'm sure you've heard of the pilgrims. They came in the 1620s. Theirs was not for financial gain, but they wanted religious, uh, they came for religious reasons. They wanted an area that they could make just for themselves. And so some colonies were started for that purpose, but most were for financial reasons. So they started to spread out all along the coast, and we call them the 13 colonies. They were really 13 states, or almost like 13 separate countries. They each had, each had their own government, their own money, their own way of doing everything. So by 1775, there were about two and a half million um, European and Africans living in this place. Now, mind you, there were already Native Americans all over the United States thriving. And these Europeans coming in were driving them out. And so that's another part of history that's not always told. And so that's an important part to note as well, that they were not just coming into empty land. Now, the people that came from Europe, they were technically under the King of England. And so they were following the rules that the king set, and they considered themselves British, and they followed British rules under King George. And so King George started putting rules on them and taxes on them. And eventually they got kind of tired of that because they weren't even living in England. Why were they having to pay all these taxes and do all these things when the king wasn't even there? Why was he making them do all of these things? So they started to kind of get upset with him. And so the king sent some soldiers over to try to keep order and make sure they were following the rules and doing what they were supposed to be doing. Well, this made the colonists very angry. And, and so they started to get more and more and more upset. And eventually all of that upset feelings inside of them um, kind of blew the top off and a war broke out. And we call that war the Revolutionary War. And so when that war started happening, little battles all along the coast began to occur. And so they were constantly having small battles. A group of men got together and they decided, you know what, we're gonna make a document and we're going to tell the king all the things we don't like about him. And we're going to break up with England. It's over. We do not want to be under his rule anymore. And they made a list of all the things that they didn't like about him and all the rules that they were not going to follow anymore. And they all signed their name to it. That was very, very risky because that was committing treason. And that was against the law. They could have been um, arrested and they could have been hanged for that. And so it's a very, very uh, big risk. And so that document that they wrote, you might have heard of before, it's called the Declaration of Independence. And they signed it on a very important day, um, actually a couple days before, but it was published on July 4th, 1776. Do you know something that we celebrate on July 4th, 1776? Fourth of July, right? And that's because of that document that they wrote telling the king, no more, we're not, we're not gonna be under your rule. And so what happened was, that document kind of um, sped up the process and the war is still going on and we continue to fight in the Revolutionary War for many years after that document is signed and sent to the king because he didn't even want to see it. He didn't even want to read it. And so the war went on for about seven more years and at the end, in 1781, at the Battle of Yorktown, the British finally gave up. They said, never mind, we don't want to fight this war anymore, you win. So they surrendered. But 18th century news doesn't travel very fast. So <laughs> the war continued on for quite a while. And a couple of years later, they signed the Treaty of Paris, ending the war, ending our rule under King George. And so then at that time, we formed our own government and our own way of living. And we became an independent United States of America. All right. So today, we are going to make our own butter. Now, this is something you can do at home. If you're living in 18th century colonies, you cannot just run to the store and pick up some butter. That would just be silly when you can make it yourself. So all you need today is a jar of some kind. It could be a Tupperware container or, or this is just a mason jar, something like that. And you need some whipping cream. Okay, I just picked this up at Brahms. You can get it anywhere you'd like. And all you're gonna do is you're gonna pour it in the jar, just however much you think you might want to make. Just put some in there. 
Now, you can put a little bit of salt if you'd like. It's optional. You do not have to, but I'll just put a pinch of salt in there and then put the lid on. And all you're going to do to make butter is shake. Now, you have to shake for quite a while. So I have an assistant today that's going to shake it for me while I read. So, so my assistant is my principal, Mrs. T, and so she is going to shake, shake, shake while we read a book together today. And by the end of the book, we will have some butter. So, so I hope that you will check that out at home and try to make your own butter. All right, so a story I'm going to share with you today is about a man named Benjamin Franklin. You may have heard of him. He's a pretty famous inventor and scientist and founding father. And so Benjamin Franklin was um, a very famous man from Philadelphia. He's actually born in Boston, but raised in Phil or spent his time in Philadelphia. And he, he lived to be a very wise old man, and he did many, many things in his lifetime. Do you know that Benjamin Franklin actually only went to school for two years of his life? He only attended, attended two years of school. He went to a Latin school in Boston as a child, and he really didn't enjoy that. So he went to work with his family, and they were a candle-making family. And so you know how you make candles in colonial times? You would get a long piece of string and a bowl of wax, and you would dip it and dip it and dip it in the wax and dip it and dip it and dip it in the wax. And it just got really old, and he was like, why do I have to dip these candles all day long? This is the worst, most boring job I've ever had in my entire life. And so he said, forget this. And so he went to apprentice or work with his brother. brother. And his brother had a printing shop in town. And so he became a printer. And he was very good at printing. And I'll show you a little bit more about printing at the end. But he was a really good printer. And so he made good money being a printer. And he was able to retire from printing at age, at age 42. And that left half of his life he could spend um, working on science and inventions. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the things he invented. Invented. So many things that you still use today. All right, so let's get to our book, Now and Ben, The Modern Inventions of Benjamin Franklin. So now and then, we think about Ben, Dr. Benjamin Franklin, to be precise, and we think about his many inventions, inventions he originated more than 200 years ago. It was as if Ben could see into the future. Almost everything he created is still around today. For instance, now our newspapers are filled, are filled with illustrations. Ben was the first to print a political cartoon in America. The cartoon encouraged the American colonies to join together or die like the disconnected snake. And I actually have a flag back here, and you might be able to see it, of his first political cartoon. It was a very famous political cartoon where it showed all of, of the colonies. Each part of the snake was one of the colonies, and he was saying that you've all got to all got to come together as one group. Because remember, I told you they were kind of operating as individual states or countries. So he wanted them to all join together because together we're stronger than in, uh, broken apart. Now, bifocals are very common. Bifocals combine two sets of lenses into one pair of glasses. The bottom lens helps see near. The top lens helps you see far. Ben originally designed bifocals for himself after he grew tired of switching between two pairs of glasses. Now, our world relies on electricity. In the 18th century, many people still believed that lightning was an act of anger or a punishment from God. Ben was one of the scientists who discovered the true nature of electricity and how to use it. He learned that lightning is electricity when he attached a small metal wire to the top of a kite and gathered electricity from a storm cloud. Now, Ben did not uh, invent electricity. Electricity um, exists naturally in nature, and he just found that the lightning bolt had electrical currents in it. Now, many buildings and homes used lightning rods to protect against lightning strikes. Ben invented the lightning rod, and he was the first to use it. The pointed iron rod acts like a magnet, and it grabs an approaching lightning bolt from the sky before it can strike the rooftop. The electricity then travels safely down a long wire into the ground. It prevents fires, and it keeps dangerous amounts of electricity away from a house. Now, the gadget seen, and it goes by many names like the grabber. Everyone has seen one. It's the long stick that helps grab items from out-of-reach places. 
Ben invented the original device and called it the long arm because it worked like a very long arm. Does anybody have a grabber at home? Now, swimmers and divers use flippers to move through water. Ben invented these when he was a boy. He was an avid swimmer, and he built wooden flippers for both his hands and his feet. Now, ships travel across the Gulf Stream to take advantage of the faster currents. Ben measured, charted, and publicized the Gulf Stream during his eight voyages across the Atlantic Ocean. He spent a lot of time in Europe. Now, we understand and accept the benefits of vitamin C. Ben was an early prom uh, promoter of eating citrus fruits to help prevent a disease called scurvy. Now for a musical interlude. Ben invented the glass harmonica. He was able to create music simply by touching his wet fingers to a row of spinning glass bowls. Mozart and Beethoven were so moved by the sounds that they composed for the instrument. Today, glass harmonicas are very rare you are more likely to find one in a museum than in a music store. Now, our fireplaces are very efficient and easy to use. Ben improved on the primitive fireplaces of his day when he designed the Pennsylvania fireplace, later renamed the Franklin stove. He built it with iron to contain the heat from a long fire after the logs were burned. It also sat away from the wall to heat the room more evenly. The smoke ventilation was not perfect, but later inventors improved it. Before Ben's fireplace, indoor smoke could be suffocating. Now, chairs come in all shapes and sizes. Ben designed two chairs that are still useful. The writing chair combined a desk and chair into one. The library chair was a combination of chair and stepladder. Had a little piece that flipped up to make a stepladder. Now, everyone has seen a rocking chair, but not everyone has seen Dr. Franklin's rocking chairs. He had one that had a fan on top to fan him. And he also had one that churned butter. I think Mrs. T would appreciate that if it churned butter for her right, for right now and so she wouldn't have to shake. Now, every year, we observe daylight savings time, which means we set our clocks ahead one hour in the springtime. As a result, it stays darker longer in the morning when most people are sleeping, and it stays light longer at the end of their day so we can save more energy. In the fall, we return the clocks to standard time. Ben suggested this idea in one of his essays as a way to save money by burning fewer candles. Farmers could also gain more work time in the evening. Daylight savings time was not officially practiced until World War I, more than 100 years later. As for clocks, Ben designed the first clock with a second hand. Now, every automobile has an odometer to measure the distance it travels. Ben invented the odometer when he was postmaster general so he could measure his postal routes. He used to deliver the mail. Now, almost every large community includes a library, a hospital, a post office, a fire department, and a sanitation department. Ben lived in a city that had none of those establishments, so he helped organize the first of all of them in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia. Now, and then, we owe thanks to Ben for his important inventions but many would agree that his greatest accomplishments came in the form of documents, documents that helped shape the world. Ben had a pivotal role in developing America's Constitution, the Treaty of Alliance with France, the Treaty of Paris with England, and the Declaration of Independence. He actually helped write the Declaration of Independence with Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. It's remarkable that one man could achieve so much in a lifetime. He has certainly helped to form the modern world Will his contributions help to form the future? And this picture just has a lot of silly things that could or may happen in the future. All right, so hopefully you learned some new inventions that maybe he created in his lifetime. All right, so we're gonna check on the status of our butter and see how it is coming along. So if I open up the jar, you can see, you can see it too in the top. See how thick it is that it's stuck to the top of the jar? So I even brought some bread today so we could spread it and you can see just how good it works. Now, I tried this out yesterday at home and my son said it was the best butter he'd ever had and he even had a butter sandwich just because it was so good. So you might try that out. So I'm gonna get some bread. and we'll spread it and just see how it turns out. 
So it becomes kind of a solid inside the jar. You can see that's how you know it's ready. When you're shaking and you no longer hear it sloshing around, it makes a nice fluffy butter. Um, it's not super hard to spread. But then you have real butter. So that's how it turns out. You can make your own butter at home and try it. And I would love to see if you want to post it on our Facebook page. I would love to see the butter that you make at home. I think that'd be a great project. All right. So now before we end today, I want to tell you about some primary sources. So um, I spend a lot of time in a place called Colonial Williamsburg. And that is a place, a living history museum, where they have a lot of recreated 18th century things. And they have um, original 18th century buildings that you can go inside of and tour like a museum. It's a wonderful place to go as a family and vacation or check out. There's lots of things to do in that area. So I'm going to show you a few things that I've picked up there that these are not actually from the 1700s, but it is created to look like they would have. So the first one, this one, I'm going to try to stump you with this. These are pretty tricky. All right, so I have two objects here I want you to take a look at. I want you to decide what do you think those could be. They're long and skinny and white, and they feel like they're made out of maybe like porcelain, they're hard, um, breakable probably. Any ideas? Most of the time when I show these to students, they always guess that they're bones. They're not actually bones. These are actually wig curlers. So in the 18th century, almost men, including Benjamin Franklin, wore wigs. And so they would want their wig curled nicely. So what they would do is they would take these and they would warm them and then they would roll their hair and pin it. And so it would be like a curling iron of today's time. So they would use these to curl their wigs. Now, some other things I have over here. Let's see. This is a game called cup and ball. This is something that you can create yourself at home um, with a stick and glue a Dixie cup on top and attach a string and some kind of small ball. And you try to get the ball in the cup. I am not good at this game, but you want it to land in the cup. And here I have a fan. Most ladies would always have a fan. Remember, there's no air conditioning, and so it's nice to have as an accessory and um, also as a cooling device. Uh, Martha Washington, George Washington's wife, she loved fans and collected fans, and she had many, many fancy and different kinds of fans. People would give them to her as gifts. Here I have a gentleman's hat. So um, someone like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or anyone um, that was male would wear a tricorn hat like this and you would wear it um, just like so and you could decorate your hat with different bows or um, things that you could pin on your hat now this you might be thinking what in the world is that this is a pocket okay so my gown today does not have pockets a lot of things didn't have pockets sewn in so what they would do is they would make their own pockets and you would sew this under your petticoat or under your dress. So this would be tied over here on the side underneath your petticoat before you put your dress on. And all the, the dresses have a little slit in the side. So you could put your hand down and that's where you could keep your fan or your pocket watch or your money. It could go down inside your pocket, but it would be under your dress. So it's just a way of having a pocket. And so a lot of ladies would decorate them and make them cutesy like this one is red and blue. No one would really see it. It would just be a fun thing to have um, and make it cute. So that's something you could make yourself at home, home really easily too if you wanted to try that out. Now, I talked to you about um, the fact that Benjamin Franklin had a printing press. So I'm going to show you a picture of a printing press in the 18th century. Um, so they would print things like uh, newspapers and they could print broadsides, they could print flyers, they could print documents for the courts. And so the way that you would print things is you have these little bitty letters and you would have to put each individual letter into a case. And you would, you would put that case down here in the bottom and then lay your paper on top and flip this cover down and press it after you put the ink on for each page of your paper or whatever it was you were printing. So it would take a long time to print something. So newspapers didn't necessarily come out every single day, often once a week. Um, Benjamin Franklin was famous for printing his, um, his, his farmer's almanac that he created. And so those were things that they would print every so often. But it was a long process to do 
uh, printing in the 18th century. And that's where your uppercase and lowercase uh, comes from, because which letters do you use the most? The little letters, right? The lowercase letters. So you would keep all of those little letters in a lower case. You would keep them down low because you use them the most frequently. You would have to pull each individual letter to line up in your cases. So um, another thing that they did is here we have a quill pen. So you keep your ink in your ink base here. You would, you would dip your pen in and you would write with a feather. Now, when you got done and you wanted to send a letter, there was no envelopes in the 18th century. So you'd have to find another way to seal up your paper. So you could just fold, fold it. And then you would take some wax, run it over your candle that you're using for light. And it would drip some wax on your paper and then you could seal it. I have a little seal here with an O on it for my last name. And you could push the seal and it would just seal up your paper because that was a time before envelopes. All right, so I um, have some books out today that are just some suggestions if this is something that you're interested in reading more about. Those would be great resources for you. And you can still continue to join my Facebook group. Show me if you, if you make some butter at home or if you try another colonial um, project or something that you wanna make. I'm gonna tell you some other resources that you can check out. Liberty's Kids is a great cartoon. You can look it up on YouTube or you can usually find the DVD for oh, $5 or less. Um, that has all the episodes on it and it focuses on the Revolutionary War in a really kid friendly version and it's told around Benjamin Franklin and his print shop and his apprentices that are working for him and it's a really cute um, cartoon that a lot of kids like and then we have uh, the Google Expeditions app that I talked to you about last week is a great source too for uh, VR tours and the shut the box game is something you can check out as well online so I hope you all have a wonderful day. I'm so glad we got to hang out today, and I'll see you next week. Bye.
Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome back to Storytime with Mrs. Steph. I'm so glad you could join me today. I know many of you are very excited about what's supposed to happen at my house tomorrow with those chick eggs hatching. They've been in the incubator for 21 days now. And actually tonight, probably some of them will start hatching. But there's always that early bird. And I want to show you, can you see that, Mr. Trujillo? If you see the egg with a hole in it, last night we were sitting just enjoying the news and Mr. Duff and I heard cheep, cheep, cheep from the corner of the room. And all of a sudden we saw a little bird peeping out. You can see its little uh, um, beak, but I'm not sure if you can see it in that picture. So I'm not sure if we actually caught the beak sticking out of the shell, but it's working on it. We call it the early bird. It will be the early bird. It's probably going to be a rooster. Usually those bigger ones, those early ones, turn out to be roosters in the long run. So this morning I want to continue practicing. And I know this was kind of hard to see, and I am so sorry. I wish I had brighter ones, but I don't. So we're just going to go with what we have. We talked about always talking about the calendar, and it's hard to keep up with our days right now, right? Because yesterday morning I woke up and thought, oh, it's Thursday. And it wasn't. It was only Wednesday. So we are going to talk about what month it is. What month is it, boys and girls? April. That's right. Because we had January, February, March, and April. And we haven't gotten to go to school during the month of April. And usually we have all kinds of exciting things that we do in kindergarten. We have exciting stuff stories, exciting lessons, exciting things we learned, we learned all of our letters and our numbers up to 20. So we're just working on a lot of fun stuff now. We're learning to read and put all of those letters together. If you are in first grade or second grade, you've already been doing that for a while. So you've been working on even harder things, maybe even double digit subtraction. It's pretty exciting, huh? Now, today is Thursday. Can you say the days of the week with me, boys and girls? Are you ready? Stand up if you want to. Absolutely. Ready, set? You bet. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's not very exciting, is it? Let's sing it. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, there are seven days, there are seven days, there are seven days in a week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. There are seven days, there are seven days, there are seven days in a week. And today we're actually at the very bottom of April. I don't know if you can see that, but it is, it is April the 30th. That is the last day in April. And then we marked on our calendar that tomorrow is hatching day, which is actually May 1st. But I think we're going to have an early bird hatch today. So that's pretty exciting. And I will put that on my Facebook page, Storytime with Mrs. Duff. So if you want to watch that and see those new chicks as they hatch, you can go to that, and I'll kind of keep putting updates on as we get more chicks. Now, I have all kinds of wonderful things right over here in a box, and I have something right here in this jar, and I'm going to bring it up really close because it's very hard to see. I'm going to take the lid off, not because you need to see, but because I think that oxygen needs to maybe get in there. This morning, and I mean this morning, right before I came, I went outside. And I looked in the mud puddle by my house, and guess what? There was no water in it. And I looked in the the thing where the water meter is, because sometimes there's water down in there, and we have to fish it out to read the meter. There was no water in it. So I went to my neighbor's house, and right next to his um, right next to his driveway, he has a ditch with just a little bit of water. And I went out, and I thought, there's no way I'm going to find these, but. I went in there and I found these little tadpoles. Can you see those? Those little tadpoles kind of floating around. I don't know if you can really see them. They're kind of funky looking tadpoles. So I don't know what they're going to turn into. But they are tadpoles. I did look at them. But they have big eyes and they swim around. Sometimes tadpoles are in ditches. 
sometimes tadpoles are in ponds. Sometimes they're in lakes. But when I was a little girl, we used to clean out our swimming pool every summer. We had a great big swimming pool. And I think that when my dad started building it, he thought, it's just not big enough. It's not big enough. It's not big enough. So he built a big old hole in the ground. And tadpoles would get on top of the um, cover that we would put on in the winter. And the frogs would find somewhere to lay their eggs. Well, they don't usually lay eggs in water with chlorine, but there was no chlorine in the water because it had been all winter. So they laid their eggs in that top that went down on the swimming pool. And every every time that we cleaned off that top, my dad would put a pump on there. And that pump would suck that water in those tadpoles. And it would he would suck it out from the back and it would go down the hill. And the tadpoles would just kind of swim on down the hill through the water in a little stream went all the way to our pond and then we could go down and look at the pond but I wasn't allowed to go to the pond by myself raise your hand if you are allowed to go to a pond by yourself you probably shouldn't and here's why because there's lots of mud and there's lots of things out of the ponds that are kind of dangerous now ponds are wonderful places to be ponds are places we can find tadpoles and we can find crawdads or crawfish they are places that we can find fish. We can find turtles there and maybe even some cool bugs. But there's, this, there's one thing that might be at a pond that could be kind of scary. And actually, the other day, my mom and dad were cleaning out their pool. And by their pool, not even at a, their pond, but by their pool, there were a big pile of leaves. And your parents might tell you, don't play in leaves, especially this time of year, because animals get really cold in the winter and they find somewhere warm to sleep. And my mom started moving the leaves and all of a sudden, guess what happened? A snake jumped out of those leaves and bit her on the ankle and it made her really, really sick. She had to go to the hospital and they had to give her special medicine called anti-venom. And it was kind of a cool thing, though, because people at the hospital had never seen a snake bite. They didn't really know what to do. So she's all better now. But she wanted me to warn you that if you go down to a pond or if you're going around where there's been water, don't mess around with leaves and stuff because it could be kind of dangerous. You could have good snakes or bad snakes. And there are a lot of good snakes out there. When I had a chicken coop at my house, we liked one of the snakes that was out there because he would eat all the mice and any any critters that were coming around our chicken coop and any bad snakes. But he would also he was also there to protect. So we would just kind of let him have a few eggs every once in a while and and hang out. He was a big black snake. But if you see a snake, you should never pick it up whether you think it's a good snake or a bad snake. So that's kind of my announcement today. I just wanted you guys to be aware there are snakes out there right now. We want to watch out for those because when we want to go down and we want to look at a pond or we want to look at some water or be around some water, we want to be safe. So my story today is about a little boy named Sam. Sam's grandpa had a great big pond out in the middle of his cow pasture. And every time Sam went to his grandparents' house, Sam's brother and sister they were a little bit older so they might ride a bike or go play on the swing set or they might go in the house and just hang out and watch tv but every time sam went to his grandparents farm sam wanted to go to the pond because he wanted to see all the wonderful exciting things that were there in the pond's ecosystem can you say ecosystem ecosystem very good that's a long word lots of syllables let's say that again E ecosystem. That's four syllables, isn't it? An ecosystem is where all the things live together. Well, Sam was really excited to go to the pond every time, and he would get to his grandpa's house and he'd say, Grandpa, can I go to the pond today? And grandpa'd look up at the clouds and he'd say, Oh, I think it's a little cloudy to be going to the pond today. And Sam would go off and play on the swing set or ride the bikes with his brothers and sisters. Or he'd go out and pick the garden with Grandma. But then, the next time they would go, Sam would be all excited. And he would go up to his grandpa and say, Grandpa, can we go 
to the pond today? And Grandpa would say, oh, I got a duck shitting on some eggs out there. I don't think we want to disturb her today. And Sam would go off and snap beans with Grandma on the front porch. Or he would hang out and play with his brother and sister and ride the bikes all around or swing on the big swing set. The next time... Um, Sam went to Grandma and Grandpa's house. He was so excited because he just knew Grandpa was going to let him go to the pond. It was his favorite place to go. And he came that day and he had a net with him. A net just like this one. Oh, and a bucket. Had a net and a bucket. Kind of dirty looking net and bucket. Got it out of his garage. And Sam wanted to go down and catch something in the pond. I guess that's what Grandpa said. Well, it's been raining and it's a little bit muddy out there. This went on and on and on. And one day, Grandpa said, there might be snakes out out there that could bite you and you just have flip-flops on. So the next time Sam came to Grandpa's house, Sam wore long pants and he wore his rain boots that went almost to his kneecaps. And he wore a hat to protect him from any any rain or any sun that might come out. He was ready. He had his mosquito spray on because that was one, of, was one of Grandpa's complaints. There might be mosquitoes out there today. So every time Sam wanted to go to the pond, Grandpa never took him. So this time he showed up and he was ready from head with his hat all the way down to his tootsie toe feet with his big wader boots on. And Sam walked up and he had his handy dandy net in his hand and said grandpa can we please go to the pond today grandpa looked at him and he stood there in his coverall zipped all the way up and he had his old waiter boots on to go down to the barn and he said well i guess we're gonna have to go to the pond today Oh, my goodness, you should have seen the dance that Sam did. He danced all around, and he jumped up and down, and he yelled, and he screamed, I get to go to the pond today, I get to go to the pond today, until Grandma said, oh, my goodness, please take that boy to the pond, he is so loud. And so he and Grandpa put on their boots, put their boots back on, and they walked down to the field where the pond was. Well, he got a little nervous because Grandpa had talked about those snakes being out there before, and he talked about it could rain or it might be muddy. But on this day, it was a beautiful, glorious day. Grandpa had actually mowed the field so that there wasn't a lot of big grass around and there weren't a lot of places where things could hide. And when they got down there to the pond, Sam spent the whole afternoon dipping his net down in the water, catching tadpoles and crawdads. And they looked at the duck's nest where the chick or the little duck eggs were just about ready to hatch. And then Sam's grandpa said, come here. He said, get down really low. And so they got down really low, really close to the water. And he said, now, Sam, I want you to look at something. And right there in the mud, you could see little tiny footprints. Do you know what had made those little tiny footprints in the sand? Right by the pond? <gasps> in that mud and sand, there were little bitty tiny footprints made by a frog. And Sam's grandpa said, Listen very closely, you'll hear the frogs. And they were ribbit, ribbit, ribbit. And he could hear. So Sam went looking around, and Grandpa said, If you're really careful, you might be able to catch some of those tadpoles and take them home, take them home and watch them develop into frogs. And he said, Develop into frogs? What do you mean, Grandpa? He knew about tadpoles and he knew about frogs. He didn't know anything happened in between. So Sam's grandpa scooped up some tadpoles, just like I did this morning out of that pond or out of that little ditch, and he put them in a jar. He didn't even know grandpa had brought a jar. 
And he said, Sam, I want you to take these home and I want you to watch them. We'll have to feed them. You're going to have to feed them some mealworms or maybe some grasshoppers, some, some, some food that we can get, maybe, you know, fish flakes or something like that. And we'll see if they grow into adult frogs. So Sam and his grandpa went back up to the house and it was time to go home and his grandpa handed him all the stuff to take home. And then when they got home, they put the tadpoles in a big aquarium. They started to walk. And these tadpoles, they were just little. They had started out as little eggs with kind of a dot in the middle because from the eye. And they had hatched already in the pond. But Sam watched as those little bitty teeny tadpoles swam around every day. And every day he would notice little changes in those tadpoles. One of the tadpoles started getting legs and you could see little nubs just itty bitty teeny tiny at the back of the tadpole and it started to get legs and his mom came in and said what do you think that's called Sam Sam looked it up and it was called a froglet and then as the froglet began to grow and grow and grow and grow Sam didn't want his brother and sister to look but his mom let him and she said now you need to share this experience with them so Sam watched as his froglet went from a froglet with just little legs hanging off the back and still a tail to a, to a full-grown frog. And it was just teeny tiny about this big. Well, the next time Sam went back to Grandpa's pond, guess what he took with him? It was time to let his little frogs go. Sam was kind of sad because every day he had journaled about the frogs. He had written down what the frogs were going to do. But Grandpa had told him when he took the tadpoles, he had to take very good care of them. But when it was time to let them go, he had to bring them back out and let them go in the wild. Because that's what we have to do with wild animals and little critters. We can't just keep them forever. They're meant to be outside. So th a couple of weeks later, after he had, after they had, developed into frogs, Sam and his mom and his dad and his brother and sister went back to Grandma and Grandpa's house. Grandma sat on the front porch just snapping her beans. And they, Grandpa said, well, let's go down and put your frogs in the pond. So they went down and they put the frogs in a very careful place. And then at, from that point on, every time Sam went to Grandpa's house, Grandpa made sure that he had his boots and all of his stuff to go down to the pond so they could go and visit his frogs. And Sam thought of all kinds of stories of the things the frogs might be doing in the pond, the places they might be visiting, the friends the frogs had made with the turtles and the dragonflies, maybe even some good snakes, snakes that wouldn't bite them. And even and they'd be eating worms and flies and keeping the ecosystem right in the pond. So it's pretty cool to watch things develop and grow bigger. Have you ever been to a pond, boys and girls? Raise your hand if you have. That's a lot of you. Now, should you ever go to the pond by yourself? That's right. You always have to wait for an adult to go with you. You should not go by yourself. But it would be nice if you could find a little net, maybe even at something from mom's kitchen, dad's kitchen, that you could scoop up like a strainer where you could the water would drain out and you could scoop up things from the pond. Now, some more exciting things that I've brought to today um, are some things that you might find it upon. They weren't in the story, but we talked about those footprints, and sometimes footprints and things get left behind in water. This last summer, I went to Branson with my sister and my daughter and my niece, and we went walking up a stream. It wasn't a pond, but it was a stream, and we found lots of fossils. I'm trying to find the one. Oh, it's got something really cool in it. We found this one. We like to say it's our dinosaur tooth. I think it's probably just part of a claw or something. But it was shaped like that when we found it. We thought that was kind of cool. And then we also found this cool one. And it looks like there might be a bone right in the middle of it. We thought that was kind of a cool fossil, too. So um, we found that in Branson, which is in Missouri, which isn't far from us. But in Oklahoma, you can find things at ponds also. There's a really cool pond in Claremore at the RSU Nature Reserve, and we went there also last summer. We were walking around, and we were looking. This is something else I want to show you that I also found there. Um, it's an arrowhead. It actually was carved out. So it's like a probably from an ancient Native American or something arrowhead. So that was kind of cool. But if you want to find a really cool pond that's free to go and walk around and look, the RSU Nature Reserve 
at um, RSU campus is has a really cool pond now you probably can't take things from it like i did these fossils but the it's kind of cool because you can go walk around with your family and most of the trails are paved and things so that's kind of a cool place to go if you guys want to see a pond and the ecosystem working bet you would see some cool things out there because we did we saw dragonflies and all kinds of lilies growing um we did not do anything with our words yet today so let's talk about some words let's say froglet can you say that froglet very good that is a compound word we put frog and let together to make froglet we've also got tadpole dragonfly good job excellent so there are several compound words you can think of that go with the pond with our, our pond activity and before we go i just want to show you that you can also make a pond in a jar and I saw this on Pinterest. I would love to give out credit to whoever I saw it from, but I forgot. So um, I'm just going to show you kind of an easy way. I found some dirt in my backyard because, you know, we're not really supposed to go to the store for just, just anything. And usually the ponds are pretty muddy on the bottom, so you can put some dirt in there. And usually there's a few rocks in a pond, so you put some rocks on top of it. Kind of cool found those rocks in my garage they were from somebody's aquarium at some point and we might even need a big tall rock for a frog to take a an afternoon siesta and dry out or a turtle and then I've also got a few leaves that which could float in our water as well or maybe they might be planted like they kind of look like lily pads I found some um, four leaf clovers and I thought you know this kind of look like lily pads and then you could pour your water in now mine got a little dirty when I poured it in but after a little bit it'll settle and here's our pond we've got it got our four leaf clover just kind of floated in there set it outside see what might land in your pond if your pond is big you might even get some tadpoles there another idea is to make a a frog life cycle start out with one where the eggs are Two, draw a tadpole. Three, a polywog. And four, my frog is, I'm not a very good artist, but this is my frog. So anyway, lots of ideas of things you can do with ponds. If you happen to do something really cool with a pond, let me know. Put it on um, story time with Mrs. Steph. Go on there, show me all the cool things you find at a pond. But remember, boys and girls, don't go to a pond all by yourself. Because you, for one, you want to share that experience with your mom or dad or older brother or sister or grandma or grandpa or somebody like that. But it also is not a real safe place to go by yourself. So anyway, I think that's pretty much all we have today. So before we go, I have a song. Do I have time for a song? Okay. Five green and speckled frogs sat on a spotted log waiting for the end of school. <gasps> Wait, that's a little different than the one we usually sing, isn't it? Are we waiting for the end of school? We are waiting for the end of school. But today, if you sing that with me the last few years, the waiting for the end of school, we're going to change it just a little bit because we're not waiting for the end of school at this point. We're just learning and we're going and summer will be here before we know it. Next week will be our last week together. Five green and speckled frogs sat on a spotted log eating some most delicious bugs. Yum, yum. One jumped into the pool where it was nice and cool. Now there were no green speckled frogs. Glub, glub. Were there none? There were still four. Four green and speckled frogs sat on a spotted log eating some most delicious bugs. Yum, yum. One jumped into the pool where it was nice and cool. Now there were three green speckled frogs. Glub, glub. Three green and speckled frogs sat on a spotted log eating some most delicious bugs. Yum, yum. One jumped into the pool where it was nice and cool. Now there was only one. Goodbye. You guys have a good week. Love you. See you next week.
Hey, it's Thursday again, and I'm here this week. Last week, Mr. Wilson was with you, and um, today we're going to talk about a fine grit through inspirational poetry. Um, last week, Mr. Wilson talked to you about the Oklahoma City bombing and how we as Oklahomans have always been resilient. Um, that seems to be like a theme in my life. <laughs> last couple of days, I don't get me started. Um, so, I mean, everything that I've ever like read in the last couple of days, seen on TV or heard, even on the radio, it talks about how we're resilient. So that's why I thought that maybe this would be a good topic. Um, just a little background. Um, so I became an English teacher because one day an English teacher said to me, um, I think you should write. She gave me a journal and said, this will help you. And that's how I like fell in love with writing. And I found out that I was pretty good at it. I liked it. And that's how I became an English teacher. And every, <laughs> every April, when it's National Poetry Month, kids go, oh, God, poetry. And I know some people don't like it, but there are some very good things in classical poetry that you can find, um, maybe connect with. And so I have some today that I want to share with you. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, this is one of my favorite quotes from Dead Poets Society, and Robin Williams does a fantastic job when he says, uh, when he says this, but um, you might have heard it in some commercials, but he says, we don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we are members of the human race, and the human race is filled with passion and medicine, law, business, engineering, these are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, romance, love, these are what we stay alive for. To quote from Whitman, and we're gonna talk a lot more about Whitman. Whitman says, O me, O life, of the questions of these recurring, of the endless trains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish, what good amid these is, O me, O life, O life, answer is that you are here, life exists, and identity, that the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. That the powerful play goes on and you may contribute your, a verse. And then he asked the question, what will your verse be? So today we're going to talk about how you can contribute a verse. And that's about, if you, if you had me in sixth grade, we talk, all, we talk about effort, effort all the time. So... So I have some essential uh, questions, like the big idea, what, what are we doing here? Um, when you're in middle school, high school, you start evolving, you start thinking for yourself, and you start realizing that, um, hey, life isn't all ice cream cones and, you know, unicorns. So that's when, like, life just dumps on you, and you start to have these problems, and you're trying to figure out what you want to do with yourself, and people are asking you what you want to do. And in middle school, it's like, I don't know what I want to do. But when you get to high school, you kind of have to try to figure that out. Um, and we all have big ideas. When I, was, um, when, I, when I was in middle school, I wanted to be a ballet dancer. That obviously didn't happen. So, so one, number one, why is it important to have a dream? Number two, how do people achieve their dreams? Three, can a person achieve their dreams alone? And four, what do you do once you have achieved your dreams? Now, um, if you're a Sequoia kid, you can look online, and I have the whole PowerPoint for you. Um, but you can also write these down if you're interested in answering them. They're, they're good questions. If you, should, you should ask yourself. I believe everyone should be asking themselves questions all the time, like, what do I want to do? What am, how am I going to get there? And... I think number four is important. What do you do once you get there? What do you do once you have achieved your dream? So, some vocabulary to think about. Um, so I told you resilience seems to be the word of the year, actually. Um, in the beginning of the school year, we talked about, as a faculty, how to find your grit um, and what grit really was. So I thought that was important to, to go along with this because that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about what do you do when you have hard times and how do you get past that and how do you succeed even though you may fall. Off, fall. So grit is the courage and resolve, strength of character. 
Synonyms for grit are endurance, perseverance, effort, determination, guts, and backbone. And so if you if you can see the screen, I've kind of like hi highlighted in different colors and underlined what how they all seem similar. Um, perseverance, this is my word, this is um, our counselor asks, ask us for our word. And so my word has always been perseverance. And it's sort of related to grit because it's grit and perseverance. It's, it's resolve. It's, it's a thing when you, when you have, when you have a fall, when you mess up, you don't stay down, you get up. It's persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. Maybe you don't get something today that you wanted. Maybe it's gonna happen tomorrow. You never know, but if you stop in your efforts to attain what you want, then it'll never happen. Um, synonyms for perseverance, staying power. That means like, I'm here and I'm not gonna quit. Determination, see, along with grit, the, they have the same synonyms. And assiduity, I always thought that I would mess that word up. Um, uh, here's the actual, there's a noun for that, um, assiduidness. It's the, the constant or close attention to what one is doing. It's sort of like having a goal and then making a plan to get there. Conscious, close attention to what one is doing. Synonyms for that are effort, industriness, and doggedness. If you, well, Oklahoma cattle dogs, how we have the cattle dogs, I think that's kind of where that word comes from. We see the, cow, uh, the cattle dogs and how they like herd the cattle. That's, that's, I think that's where that word comes from, have that doggedness, how staying on something um, despite any, uh, anything that you've had go on in your life. Resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. It's toughness, synonyms are durability and strength. So all of these words are sort of um, related. They could all be synonyms of each other. The main point is to achieve something that you want to achieve, you have to have these characteristics. Okay, so here's a poem by Langston Hughes and we'll have another one in a second. It says, what happens to a dream deferred? Deferred. What does deferred mean? It means to put off. Now, you can think of deferred as put off indefinitely, put off um, for a short period of time. Let's just read the rest of the poem. So it says, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar, sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? What do you think, think that he is saying by this? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? So if you're deferring your dreams, if your dreams are drying up, I would think that that meant that it was going away. Um, or fester like a sore and then run. I'm gonna combine these lines. Um, fester like a sore and then run. Maybe this means it's a wound still there. Maybe it means it's a wound, it's still there. Does it stink like rotten meat and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? I don't even wanna think about that one. That's disgusting to me. Um, stink like rotten meat. I can't even, no. That, that just reminds me of my refrigerator. Um, if you've ever left anything in your in your refrigerator for too long, um, yeah, don't go looking in mine. <laughs> is why I don't eat my leftovers. Stink like rotten meat. Um, crust over 
like certain music. To me, this and this sound the same because it sounds like oh, I don't even want to say it. Like a scab. Ugh. Rotten. I'll just take that one off there. Can a dream become rotten? How can a dream become rotten? Or maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? So this one, right here, wound's still there, sags like a heavy load. So maybe a dream becomes, a dream deferred becomes a heavy load that you haven't dealt with. If you've had me for English, you know my writing writing is atrocious. Um, so if, if it becomes a heavy load, it means you haven't dealt with it. It means you haven't confronted it. It means you haven't taken action to get where you want to go. And sometimes if you leave things alone for too long, like the meat in the refrigerator, a sore that you haven't tended to, something left out in the sun that dries up, then does it mean that it's going away? Probably not. So sometimes dreams don't go away, especially, I'm on, I'm on a leash, um, especially if you don't deal with this. And this is, and it's, that's par for the course for anything. If you don't, if you let something go for so long and you don't deal with it, you're going to suffer repercussions. And it'll always be there. Um, if you know, like we talked, we talked about Greek mythology in my last um, session with you guys. There, um, there's a guy that puts the world on his shoulders. His name is Atlas. He has to carry that burden the whole entire time. So your dreams, if they're deferred and put off, it becomes that burden that you haven't confronted and attempted. What would happen if you attempted it? Let me get out of here. All right. Okay. So good old Walt Woman. Love Walt. Um, he has a poem called Success. And so we're going to, I'm going to pick out some things in here. But what I want you to focus on is I want you to look for effort. So when we talk about grit and perseverance and resilience and assiduity, we're talking about persevering. We're talking about effort. It's like what you have to do to get where you want to go. And I don't know about anyone else, but poems have always spoke to me. Um, and they might not speak to you because you look at it and you say, oh my gosh, all these metaphors. And you, some people take them very literally, but that's what I'm here for today. I'm going to help you not take it so literally. Um, okay, so this is one of Whitman's poem, Success. We have not wings, we cannot soar, but we have feet to scale and climb. By slow degrees, by more and more, the cloudy summits of our time, the mighty pyramids of stone that wedge, cleave the desert airs, when nearer seen and better known are but gigantic flights of stairs. The distant mountains that uprear their solid bastions to the sky are crossed by pathways that appear as we to higher levels rise. The heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, were toiling upward in a night. So there's a few things in here that I want you to pay attention to. You might have already caught on to it, but Whitman is saying something very clear here to me. Anyone get it? He says, we have feet to scale and climb. And on the bottom, the last stanza, the heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight. What does he mean by that? What I think I can just put this in my pocket. What does he mean by that? Let's deal with the bottom stanza first. So we're looking for evidence of effort, persevering. How do you persevere? Right? We have this last stanza. The heights by great men reached and kept reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight and he says up here we have not wings we cannot soar so that means that things that we want 
sometimes they're not instantaneous. We can't snap our fingers or just, you know, beam me up Scotty and we're there. Sometimes it doesn't happen like that. We have, we don't have wings. We cannot soar like a bird, but we have feet to scale and climb. Here's your effort. We have feet to scale and climb. That's your effort. That's your action that you have to put in. See, he says, sometimes it comes by slow degrees and then more and more. Sometimes you're third and maybe, you, maybe you're right there and you haven't got it, but you have to keep going in, in order to get what you want. Slow degrees and then by more and more. The mighty pyramids of stone. Now, if you're familiar, familiar with the pyramids in Egypt, those did not take a day to build. I don't know how long they took. I should look that up. <laughs> it wasn't overnight, guys. It was a long, perilous journey for those Egyptians to build those pyramids. So it wasn't something that they snapped their fingers and they were done. But we, it is one of the seven wonders of the world. If you look up the seven wonders of the world, the pyramids in Egypt, are one of those. And it did not happen overnight. The mighty pyramids of stone that wedge like cleave the desert airs, when nearer seen and better known, are but gigantic flights of stairs. What do what is stairs? What does that symbolize? What does that mean? like going upwards, right? Going upwards. So a person who is trying to achieve their dreams, they're going upwards. And we'll deal with that later. The distant mountains that uprear, they're solid bastions to the sky. All right, so the last stanza. The heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight. And he says, okay, so this, these two lines. He says these, these guys who, successful people, it didn't happen overnight, guys. They said... While other people were working, right down here. But they, while their, while their companions slept, while other their, their companions slept, while other people were resting on their laurels or whatever other people do, they were constantly working to get to the next thing. Constantly working. They didn't sit down on the flight of stairs. If I just hit this, will it go? Let's see. I'm talking to myself. Oh, yay. Okay. So if you have had sixth grade English with me and possibly you've dealt with this poem before, but mother to son, we deal with, we deal with stairs in this. So let's read it. Well, I'll tell you, son, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet on the floor. Bare. But all the time, I've been a climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and going sometimes in the dark where there ain't been no light. So, boy, don't you turn back. Back. Don't you sit down on the steps because you find it's kind of harder. Kinder hard. Don't you fall now. For I still going, honey. I still climbing. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. What is she saying? If you've had me for sixth grade in English, you, we've went over this poem. So you know what she's saying. What is she saying? Life for me. She's giving her son advice. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. What is a crystal stair? Well, it's a staircase made of crystals. If so does that seem like an easy life? Yes, this would represent an easy life. Crystal stair would represent an easy life. So she says, I haven't had it easy. Now let's look for... Let's look for things that were hardships and struggles. She said it had tacks in it, splinters, boards torn up, carpet, no carpet on the floor. Think of a staircase that's boards, no carpet, splinters, tacks. You have to avoid boards. So she's had a lot of obstacles in her life. In her, life. her obstacles to success. But she says, but all the time, but all the time. I've been climbing on and reaching landings. So when you reach a landing on a staircase, it's like you get up one flight of stairs and then you have a nice little kind of kind of break from climbing the stairs. But she's been reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark. So sometimes she had no idea 
going in the dark. She had no idea where she was going and what was going to happen to her. Where there ain't been no light. So if you think about that, you turn off your lights, try to operate in the dark. Sometimes you don't know what's ahead of you and where you're going to go. But you just keep going because you have hope. You have faith. So she says to her son, boy, don't you turn back. She says, so boy, because me, because I. She says, if I can do it, you can do it too. And we have to agree with the speaker of this poem. If I can do it, you can do it too. Don't turn back. Don't you sit down on those steps. She says, if you rest too long, if you rest too long where you are, you are going to get comfortable. And then that's when it gets harder and harder to get back up and do what you wanted to do in the first place. You get complacent. That should be, well, I should put that word in there, but. Complacent. If you sit down on the stairs, you become complacent. You become okay with how things are. And I don't know about you guys, but that's not me. She says, she's still going. So I'm, I'm getting the sense that she's trying to encourage her son. Maybe he's having a hard time. She's trying to encourage him to keep going no matter what happens to him. Maybe he loses a job. Maybe he goes bankrupt. Maybe he has health problems. But don't stop. Don't become complacent. Get right back up. Well, we have an idiom. When you fall off the horse, you get right back up and you continue on. Okay. And this is the last poem that I want to talk about today. And uh, the funny thing about this poem is... Um, when I actually was going to do last week's thing before I had a stroke, um, I had researched this poem, and it turns out that Timothy McVeigh used this poem before he was executed. And it just goes to show you that sometimes writers don't always intend the poems for what people use them for. Um, Anthony McVeigh blew up a building. He killed 168 people. But that's not what this writer intended this poem for. The writer, William Henley, had uh, MS. He had multiple sclerosis. Sclerosis. <laughs> I can't say it. Scler yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, um, he had problems walking. He lost a daughter. Um, so he wrote this poem saying, no matter what happens to me, guys, I am still the master of my fate. No matter what life has in store for me, I'm still the master of my fate. So I'm going to read this. Um, this is really moving for me, especially if you play sports. It's like, yeah, yes. So it's called Invictus, which means victory. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I think whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. I didn't mean to mark that out. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. So he is saying... I'm unconquerable. No matter what happens to me, no matter how straight the gate, no, that this is easy. This is that crystal stair. No matter how straight the gate, no matter how hard, this is hard. No matter how hard life is, no matter how easy or hard, I'm still in charge of my life. He says, I am the master and I am the captain of my soul. He says, it's up to me to put in that effort. It's up to me to have grit and endure. He's up effort, grit, endurance. He's got to persevere. 
Jason's got to persevere no matter what happens to him, guys. Circumstance. It's things that are beyond his control. So he says, no matter what happens to me, I'm the captain of my soul. Okay. So I'm being told that this is it, and I'm a bad ender. <laughs> so, um, but it. Oh, okay. Well, um, I thought we were over. Okay. Okay. There we go. Um, so I just want to leave with leave you with this. Um. No matter what happens to you guys, think about Plato, the allegory of the cave. Um, if you know the allegory of the cave, these two guys are sitting in the cave, cave and finally gets, well, they're chained to rocks in the cave. One finally gets free and he goes out and he comes and he sees all this stuff that he's never seen and experienced before. And then he goes back into the cave and says to the guy, hey, I'm going to break you free and we can leave and be gone. And the guy says, no, I'm happy here. Sometimes when you fall off that horse and you become complacent, you also don't want to have, you don't want to put in any effort. So you've got to put in effort to get where you go. Um, it, it doesn't get any easier than that. And you're going to find as you get older, you go through middle school and high school, that you're going to have to put in effort just like we all do. So... So I will see you next week, um, and Miss Dorsey is up next with some math. She's going to entertain us today because she is super spunky. <laughs> so um, have a nice week, the rest of you. Have a nice weekend. Thanks.
I have a job at the end. Oh, hello, people! <laughs> Didn't know I was live, but that's okay. Um, hope you guys have had a great week. Um, I've been pretty uh, just secluded at home with my kids. We did do a social distancing outing yesterday, so that was fun. Um, but I'm back here with some more algebra. So we have pretty much done a lot of the meat and potatoes of basic algebra. You know, we started out with like terms and learning about the different parts of algebraic expressions. And then we went to one step equations and then we went to two step equations. And so now that we have those skills, we can put those skills to use with multi-step equations. And what does multi-step equation mean? Well, it means that I have more than two steps. And so um, I've, I found this on the internet, and I'm like, uh, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And I know that's not proper English, but oh well. I'm a math teacher. So this says the goal of solving equations is to get the variable on one side of the equal sign and the number on the other side of the equal sign. And I really like that because it goes back to our uh, balance, our scales of justice or the scales of algebra. So any equation that you have, no matter how many terms you have, on either side of the equal sign, if you, you can this basic principle, then you have all the skills you need to solve the equation. Okay, and I'm going to read these at home because I don't know how this is going to play off in, uh, on television. These are the five steps or the five guidelines to solving multi-step equations. So the first thing you're gonna look for is distributive property. And remember, distributive property is when we have a term on the outside of a set of parentheses, and what's on the inside of the parentheses cannot be put together. In other words, they're not like terms. Step two says combine like terms on the same side of the equal sign. So once we've gotten rid of the parentheses, we're gonna look at the left side of the equation. Is there anything I can put together? Then we're gonna look at the right side of the equation and ask ourselves the same question. Is there anything I can put together? Step three says if, and that's a, that's a key word there, if. There are variables on both sides of the equal sign, meaning there's a variable on the left and a variable on the right side of the equal sign, gather them all to one side by adding or subtracting. And we're gonna do a couple of those today. Step four is um, add or subtract the constant away from the variable. Um, step five is multiply or divide by, by the coefficient of the variable. And that's of course the number attached to X. Once you get to steps four and five, it, we're back to one and two step equations. So really it's steps one, two, and three that are gonna be new to you today. But I'm confident that if you guys work along with me, you can be successful. Okay, so this is the first problem we have. We have three, three X minus four X plus six equals negative two. So the first thing that I'm going to ask myself is, do I see any parentheses? And the answer to that is no. So I'm going to go back to step two, and that says put together any like terms. And I do have like terms. I have 3x and negative 4x. So I'm just going to do the math. 3x minus 4x is negative 1x. Now I'm going to put that negative 1 in front of the vari variable since it's been a while that we've been together, just so you know, um, a variable by itself with no visible coefficient means 1. I'm going to bring down, and here, I'm just going to cross those out so that I know they, they've gone away. I'm going to bring down what I haven't used. 
Now, do I need to go back to those steps to figure out where I'm at? at? I can if I want, but I could also look at this and go, hmm, that looks really familiar to me. And that's because we're at a two-step equation. Step three on the previous slide that I showed you uh, was if there's variables on both sides of the equation. And as you can see, we don't have that. So remember, those five steps are guidelines. You're not going to have every single step in every single uh, multi-step equation that you do come across. So what's the first thing to move? Negative six. Or I should say the first thing to move is positive six and it becomes a negative six. Remember, cancel that out because it goes away. And then we bring down what we haven't used. And then we just do the math. Remember, integer rules, same sign. I keep the sign and I add my numbers. So now we're at the very last step. This says negative one X equals negative eight. There's two different ways that we could have done this. If I didn't put the negative one in front, then it would just look like this. And generally, this is how you're going to see it written out. But I'm going to do both ways. So the opposite of multiplication is division. So we're going to divide both sides by negative 1. And that cancels out. Bring down the x. Bring down the equal sign. And of course, negative 8 divided by negative 1 is just 8. OK? So when I taught Algebra 2, I used to tell my kids that whenever you see a negative um, in a formula, it means to do the opposite of. Um, so this negative x really is going to tell the other side to do the opposite. I like to tell my kids it's sort of magic uh, because I'm a mathematician, duh. So anyway. This negative is just going to tell this negative 8 to do the opposite. And when we do that, we don't have to do this step. Is either one better? That's up to you. You know, you get to decide which way is easier for you to remember what to do. But either way, we get the same answer. And um, that's it. Remember, if you guys have any questions, you can feel free to Go to my um, teacher page at sequoiaeagles.net and free feel, uh, feel free, got my words jumbled up, to email me. And I'd be happy to help you with any questions you have. Okay. Oh, so now this does look different. We haven't seen any problems like this before. But let's go through our five guidelines. Uh, the first one, do we have any parentheses? The answer is no. So we're going to go to step two. Are there any like terms that I have to put together? Now, some of you guys at home might be saying, oh, yeah, Mrs. Dorsey, I can put together the P's. No, you can't because I'm looking at this side of the equal sign for like terms. And then I'm looking at this side of the equal side, uh, equal sign for like terms. So none of these sides have like terms on the same side that I can put together. So let me go ahead and erase these circles so we're not confused once we go ahead and start solving. So step one and step two, there's nothing we can do with. But step three, if I have variables on both sides of the equal sign, then I need to group those together. And so this goes back to our first slide. Remember, in equations, we want all the variables on one side and all of the constants or the numbers on the other. So what I tell my kiddos in my classroom is it's good habit to just always put your variables on the left side and the numbers on the right. So that's exactly what we're going to do. And remember back to my uh, scale of justice. I want to balance it. What I do to one side, I have to do to the other. So here we go. I want to move this P 
to the other side because I want my variables on the same side. So if it's a positive P, it becomes a negative P. And then I move it over here. Okay. Now, if I move something over to the left, I have to balance it out. So now I'm going to move something back over to the right. And the only thing to do is to move the positive 12. And if it's a positive 12, it becomes a negative 12. So now I'm going to subtract 12 right here. Now this might look pretty jumbled up to you, but if I ignore what I've crossed out and pretend like it's not there and I just do the math, then I'm going to have a pretty simple problem. So negative 2p minus p is negative 3p. This one away, so I don't need to look at that. Equal sign. 15 minus 12 is 3. And this one away, so I don't have to look at that. And I now have a one-step equation. So I'm going to do what, guys? You're right, I'm gonna multiply, not multiply, see, you were right, I was wrong. I'm gonna divide both sides by negative three. So I'm left with P equals negative one. Because three divided by negative three is negative one. Remember your integer rules. When I'm multiplying or dividing, if I have opposite signs, my answer is negative, okay? And here we have a similar problem to what we just did. I don't have any parentheses, so I don't need to do distributive property. Um, I don't have any like terms. There's no k's over here, and there aren't any other k's over here that I can put together. So what's the first thing I'm going to move? Remember, I want all of my variables on the left-hand side of the um, equal sign. So I'm going to move that negative 7k, and it's going to become a positive 7k. So it goes, goes away, and it comes over here. So positive 7k. And remember, whatever I do to one side, I have to do to the other. So since I moved something to the left, I now have to move something to the right. So, and I'm going to use a different color so that's easy to see. If this is a positive 24, it becomes a negative 24. So now that goes away. And now we just do the math. Negative 4k plus 7k is 3k. And for those of you that are con confused, how did I get 3k? Remember your integer rules of adding and subtracting. When they're opposite signs, I keep the sign of the bigger number and subtract. Okay, bring, bring down your equal sign. And then same thing right here. I have a positive 12 and a negative 24. Those are opposite signs. And my rule says to keep the sign of the bigger number, so I know my answer is going to be negative. And now I just subtract. So 24 minus 12 is 12. And I am now at the one-step or two-step equation part of my multi-step equations. So... 3k is multiplication, and the opposite of multiplication is division. So I'm going to divide both sides by 3, bring down my variable, bring down my equal sign, and just do the math. Negative 12 divided by 3 is negative 4. Now, I want to remind you guys of some great online tools that you can use. Um, I tell my kids that, you know, when we're in school, you don't have to just go by what I say. Uh, YouTube is a great resource, of course, with parental permission. Remember, my first week, I told you guys about Yay Math, 
Math Antics, Khan Academy. Those are all amazing YouTube video resources that you can just type in. You can type in multi-step equations, and then depending on which one of those resources you use, just type that after it, and it'll pull up a bunch of videos. And it will even pull up videos that I haven't watched. But watch them, you know. There might be another teacher out there that explains it in a way that you understand it um, other than me. And that's okay. You know, I don't, I don't get upset by that. Um, and then you can share that resource with me and then I can pass it along to my students. So, okay. Another um, equation like we just did. 7 minus m equals 5m minus 5. Now, I do want to remind you guys that in the earlier equations that we were solving, I said, now, some of you guys are going to look at that equation and automatically go, hey, I don't have to show my work because I know what I'm doing. I can just look at the equation and figure out the answer. And I said, what? Nah, you might not always be able to do that. And this is one of those equations. Now, I have some students, you know, Aiden, Riker, that are probably going to sit in their desk and try to figure that answer out before showing their work. Show your work. Love you guys. Okay, so remember, I don't have uh, parentheses. I don't have like terms on either side of the equal sign that I can put together. So that takes me down to step three or guideline three. Variables on both sides of the equal sign. Remember, I want everything that has a variable to go to the left. Everything that doesn't have a variable to go to the right. So that's what I'm going to do. The opposite of 5m is negative 5m. Ooh, m. And so that goes away. Remember, whatever I do to one side, I have to do to the other. So if I move something over to the left, I have to move something to the right. So that positive M becomes negative 7. Now, I just do the math. Negative 1M minus 5M is negative 6M. Um, and for those of you at home, if you wanted to write in uh, one in front of the M, that's totally fine. And I'll be repeating that over and over again, just so you know. Negative 5 minus 7 is negative 12. And then, of course, I'm going to look at that and go, oh, that's a one-step equation. I know what I'm doing. And hopefully, you guys have really started to get the hang of this at home um, because I'm confident that you guys have all the skills you need to be successful in math and to be successful with this kinds of concepts or these kinds of concepts. So I'm going to divide both sides by negative 6 and solve my um, equation. Negative 12 and negative 6 is positive 2. Okay. Um, I do want to recommend a movie to watch. Uh, it's called The Man Who Knew Infinity. It is a movie about uh, an Indian Hindu mathematician, Ramanujan. It is amazing. Um, it's not free. You do have to buy it off of um, Amazon. It might be free on Netflix. I haven't looked, but I do own the movie. And I show that to my classes every year. And I have kids at the beginning that say, oh my gosh, Mrs. Darcy, this is so, this is going to be such a boring movie. They love it. So I highly recommend it. Okay. So we have a, another problem like we just did. So this time I'm going to just do the problem and then you say the steps out loud at home, okay? Now, did you ask yourself or say out loud, no parentheses, no like terms on either side of the equal sign. Good for you if you did. Whatever I do to one side, I have to do to the other. 
And now I can just do the math. 3x minus 4x is negative x. I'm not going to write down the 1, okay? You can at home if you want to. And then negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. Now remember, what does the negative x mean? It's magic. It's going to tell the other side to change its symbol by doing the opposite. So we have x equals 3. I do want to mention this. There are some math teachers that require you to show the step. That's okay. Not all math teachers teach the same. And there's nothing wrong with that because that's the great thing about math. There's never one way that you have to do things unless your teacher tells you to. Okay? As teachers support each other. Next slide. Okay, I am going, ooh, yeah, I'm going to skip that one because I feel like we've done enough of those. You should have a good handle on that. But this one we are going to do. So let's think back. Step one says, parentheses, this problem doesn't have any. Step two, like terms. Yes, those of you that said, Mrs. Darcy, we've got like terms, you'd be correct. Because look at this. I have 2x minus x on the left side of the equal sign, and I go ahead and put those together. 2x minus x just gives me x. So now I'm going to rewrite the entire problem. Now we're going to go a little bit deeper here. If you were in Algebra 1 or in Algebra 2, you would not have to go any further. Because you might be able to say, oh, the answer is identity. What does identity mean? Well, I think of identity identical twins. These are the exact same problem. So that means they're identical or identity property, but we're going to solve it anyway. You can just tell your math teacher next year if you're in the seventh or eighth grade and they're going to think you're a genius. So I'm going to move this X over here. And I'm going to move this three over there. So X minus X is zero. Do not put zero X. And here's why. If you put zero X, what is zero times X? Zero. That's why you don't do that. Um, bring down your equal sign. Three minus three is zero. So when you get to a problem where zero equals zero, that's when you know that your answer is identity, okay? Okay, because we are running low on time, I want to go to, we're going to do the problem on the left. So here I have, actually, you know what? Forget that. I can change my mind. We're going to do the problem on the right. I have parentheses, and the first thing you're going to want to do is say, oh, let's do the distributive property, and I'm going to tell you that is the long way. Parentheses also mean what? Multiplication. Very good. So what's the opposite of multiplication? Division. So why can't I just divide both sides by two to get rid of that on thing on the outside? I can. It's a beautiful thing. So 2x plus 1 plus x equals 10. I have like terms that I need to put together. I've got 2x plus x, which gives me 3x. So those go away. Bring down what I have used. Now I have just a regular two-step equation. So I'm going to subtract 1 on both sides, okay? And I get 3x equals 9. I'm going to divide both sides by 3. 
and then I'm going to have x equals 3. I just want to talk about a couple of things before we wrap our time up here together. Uh, there's a lot of different rules in algebra. And for example, if this answer was like 8 over 3, you would leave your answer as 8 over 3. So like in algebra, we don't use the x for multiplication, we use a dot. We don't turn our answers into mixed numbers, we leave them improper. So it's important to remember those things, that it's okay if you're confused at the beginning, but listen to your teacher, let them guide you through the land of algebra. It really is a fun place to be, all right, especially if I'm your leader. So, <laughs> so next week, that's it for my lesson. Next week, we're going to take a break from doing regular math, and I'm going to share with you my real passion, and that is the history of mathematics. We're going to talk about some incredible mathematicians that have shaped <laughs> these girls in here. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. And we're going to talk about the mathematicians that have shaped our world as we know it. And I promise you, you will never look at math the same way again. So remember, if you have questions, reach out to me um, through Google Classroom if you're one of my students. Reach out to me through um, my teaching at sequoiaeagles.net. Look for me under the middle school. And I would be happy to help you. Don't forget, Khan Academy, great app to use. Also um, on YouTube, Yay Math. And I know I keep saying that, but these are great websites or you, uh, YouTube resources that I really want to encourage you to look at. Yay Math, Math Antics. Math Antics, the guy's kind of silly. But um, they, they take it uh, step by step and make it fun. So today I want to challenge you to go out into the world and find something related to math. Share it with me on my YouTube video that RSU has generously provided. And we will see you next week. Bye.
Oh, hi. I was just trying a little experiment here to see if I could tell the difference between these two black balls. They're both the same size. They have the same mass. They're made of the same material. This is my happy ball. Bounces very nicely. This is my sad ball. And I'm trying to figure out what's the difference between them. I'll tell you the, the difference later. Today, we're going to talk about the nature of science. Uh, science is our way of knowing how the world works, dealing with how things ha happen, why they happen, what causes them. So let's try a little. You know, to be a good scientist, you don't have to be a super brain to be a scientist. Just ask a question and look for the answer. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start out with a little observation. I have in this some water. I'm going to pour it into this cup. Now then, remember, I poured it in this cup. Now, which cup is the water in? This one right here. And if you said this one, you would be correct. So now I've poured it into this cup. Now which cup is it in? If you said this cup, again, you would be correct. All right, one more time. Now remember, I poured it into this cup. Now which cup is it in? Yeah, you would say the middle, right? Guess what? The water has vanished. What happened to it? Hmm. So there's the question, observation. He poured water into that cup. Question, what happened to the water? Well, before we got started, I had placed some, some stuff in there that turned the water into a gel. Now, let me say this. This is the same stuff that made diapers super absorbent. So what you can do, if you want to play with some of this, get some unused disposable diapers rip them open, pull the lining out, stuff it into a Ziploc bag, zip it up, shake it real hard for a couple of minutes. That stuff that settles down in the corner will be this water lock that you can play with. And trust me, it's not hazardous, so there's no problems with that. Has anybody really missed not having any, uh, any uh, snow this year? Well, I found some other stuff here. Simple white powder. I'm going to pour some water into it and let it go. And guess what? I have instant snow. It looks like snow. It's not quite as cold as snow, but it is wet. And, and the very same stuff that they used when they needed to make a snow scene in the movies. So we can just brush that off, and it will dry out and revert back to a powder. In fact, there's a very famous person, Steve Spangler, who found 55 barrels of this stuff. He didn't know what to do with it. So what he did was he started playing around with it and found out that it would make instant snow like this. He started figuring out how much water it would hold, decided that since his hometown, which is Denver, had not had any snow, they were going to give someone a snow Christmas, a white Christmas. And the only logical person that they could think of was his brother. So he went out, he mixed 
some of the stuff with water. He went out to his brother's house, covered it snow. There was snow on snow on the fences, snow on the mailbox, even snow on the houses. And they let it sit there for a few days. Gave Denver a chance to come out and see the white Christmas. The legal department for where Steve was working at the time came back and said, all right, time to get rid of this stuff. So he had his crew out there. They've got brooms. They've got shovels. They're cleaning all this up. But what they hadn't realized is during the time that it was sitting there, some of it was drying out and they couldn't get it out of the grass. So the next time it rained, poof, instant snowstorm. Yeah. All right. So that's an observation. And again, you don't have to be a super genius to be a scientist. You just have to follow the scientific method, series of logical steps in answering a question. First one. Make an observation. Your observation with the cups. You saw me pour the water into the cup. That's an observation. Now, People tend to think that an observation is strictly things that they see. That's not correct. An observation is anything that you encounter or anything that you experience with your five senses. You could see it. You can hear it. You can smell it. You can taste it. You can feel it. That's an observation. It's any one of those five. For example, you saw this artificial snow. Now, if you were here, you could feel it. Real smell. Yeah, it tastes pretty bland. Doesn't make any sounds. But those are all observations that we can use. All right. So we've made an observation. Step two, ask a question. Remember, I said science is a way of knowing how our world works, why it does what it does. If you've ever gone out and asked the question, why is the grass green? Why does the sun rise in the east and set in the west? Why does the wind blow? Those are all questions that you can answer as a scientist. You can set up something to do that and to find the answers. Uh, some of the brightest scientists really weren't any better or any more intelligent than you. Isaac Newton, um, Albert Einstein, they were just as intelligent as you are. The only difference is that they had more experience, more things to work with, but they asked the questions. So once we've asked a question, next thing we need to do is conduct some research. Maybe your question's already been answered. Let's face it, Isaac Newton asked the question, what is light? And he went and did some things to find out the nature of light. And that was how he realized what nature, what the light really is. But he's answered the question, what is light? All right, so now let's say for an example, continue on our example. Number four, your research did not answer your question. Set up a hypothesis. This is a question that you are looking for the answer. And generally, a good hypothesis is stated as if then. If I do A, then B will happen. 
if I take a balloon and I've got some special powder in there and I'm going to take some of this pour it into this beer add just a little bit of water here now I'm going to pour it into this flask Now, my question is, if I stretch this balloon over the mouth of this flask and dump the powder into there, what will happen? If, if I stretch the balloon over the mouth of the flask, if I dump the powder into it, what will happen? There it is. So the balloon is inflating. That's the answer to my question. If then, if I dump the powder into this liquid, then the, the balloon will inflate. Now we've got our hypothesis. Next thing we want to do is an experiment. And that's basically what I've done here. I said, what would happen if, if I dumped the powder into the, or into the liquid, what would happen to the balloon? And I've conducted that experiment. So now we've done our experiment. We're going to analyze our data. What does this show us? This shows us that that is causing some sort of chemical reaction. It's generating a gas. So now we've got our analysis. Next thing we want to do is come to a conclusion. All right, so if I said, if I dump that powder into the liquid, the balloon will inflate. That's my hypothesis. If, then. If, then. We did the experiment. We analyzed it. The balloon did inflate. Our conclusion, my hypothesis was correct. But we're not finished yet. There's one more thing we need to do. And this is not not recognized as a part of the accepted scientific note or scientific method, but it's something that I feel is very important. Report. Report your results. Tell someone what it is that you did, how you did it, why you did it, and what results you got. If you do the experiment, but you don't tell anybody, why do it in the first place if it's going to, if it's going to be something that's going to help people? Now, we've got another little experiment here. I've got some more water. I have two rocks. Hypothesis. Or question, we, observation. I've got water. I've got rocks. Question. Will these rocks, what will happen to the rocks when they fall into the water? Well, the obvious answer is they're going to get wet. We've done some research. We haven't found an answer to our question, partly because we don't know what type of rocks we've got. Hypothesis. What happens to a rock when it falls into a lake or a pond? It goes to the bottom, correct? A little experiment would drop this one in. And it does. It falls to the bottom of the beaker. Now, this rock is a little bit different. So our hypothesis might be it's going to have the same effect. It's going to drop. 
drop it in the water, and look at that. That rock floats. I'll do it again. That rock is floating. And yes, it is a rock. So we've done our experiment. We've analyzed the, this. Conclu the conclusion that we can come to this is that this rock that went to the bottom of the beaker is different than this rock that floated. Um, I know that you have probably seen this happen. I take a plastic ring. I'm going to balance, very carefully balance, a hex nut on top, if I can do it. Come on. Now then, if you've seen these videos before, you have an idea of what's going to happen. I'm going to hit the ring. The ring is going to pull out of the way. This hex nut should drop into the beak or into the bottle. You ready? Uh oh, something didn't go right. All right, here's what's happening, and I know this from personal experience. When I hit the ring like this, that ring is going to compress, it's going to squeeze up, it's going to throw the hex nut off. If I want that hex nut to fall into the bottle, I take my finger and just hook it right here and pull it out of the way instead of hitting it. And it will happen every single time. Uh, another question that you might ask is where do those two liter pop bottles come from? Well, believe it or not, it comes from this. This is called a preform. And what they will do is they will take this, put it into a mold, heat it up, force air down in there, and blow this up just like a balloon to make their two-liter bottle. Uh, you notice I've got a second one here that's different. This is two-liter. This is a one-liter bottle. Now, if you can find something like this, ask your parents about this. Ask them if they remember the lava lamps from the 70s. What I've got here is I've got a layer that's dark green. I've got a layer that's clear. And when I turn it over, notice how it flows. Notice that the dark green is always staying at the bottom. So here's another question. What in the world is going on that would cause that? Any ideas? Any clues? All right. The dark green is simply water. And I've added some food coloring to it. The clear up here is vegetable oil. It is less dense. It has less mass per unit volume than the water. So it's going to float on top of the water. That's why oil floats on water. That's why it's so hard to put out a, an oil fire if it's over a lake. I've done my observation. Those layers will stay separate. I've asked my question, why? I've done some research, and I found that the scientists who have done this have told me water is more dense than oil. Well... All right, so again, I may not believe it. My hypothesis is that if I put oil and water together in a tube like that, the oil will separate, the water will flow to the bottom, oil will 
flow to the top. I've done my experiment. I analyzed my data. I've come to the conclusion that those people who told me this were correct. And now I'm going to report it. Actually, I'm going to take this and set it up so that I can show people. Isn't that cool? All right. Another thing that you can do. Fact check. This box says that it is fortified with iron. Does that mean that it's actual iron or some sort of iron compound? Well, you can take open a box of total. You can put it into a plastic bag like this, add some water to it, mash it up, two or three minutes, make a big mash out of it, then take this very strong magnet and you can pull the iron out of that cereal. They actually put iron shavings into that cereal. Now, Let's see, uh, I've shown you this. Shown you this, this. All right. You've got food coloring in water here. Now I've got some of these tubes, and I've got different colors in here, and I can hold them up to the light and see the color. I can mix the colors, I can match the colors, I can do whatever I want to with them. Uh, we mentioned scientists like Isaac Newton, um, Galileo comes to mind, um, uh, Albert Einstein comes to mind. These are men that all they did was ask a simple question. Then they went looking for the answer. And again, they are no more intelligent, no smarter than you are. All right, I told you at the start, thank you, I told you at the start that I would explain the difference between my happy ball and my sad ball. Again, they are made of the same material, they're the same size, the same density, then why does this one bounce and this one not? It's all in the way that they are made. The happy ball comes together and it forms polymers. Those polymers are long chains of molecules all stretched out and they form them like this so that when the ball hits the ground, they compress and they spring back, compress and spring back, compress and spring back. That gives my happy ball its bounce. The sad ball, on the other hand, doesn't bounce because instead of being mashed like this, the polymers are like this. So there's no bounce, there's no give to them. So that's how this ball does not bounce. All right. And Oh, I know one more thing. I know that these balls have the same density because I've measured the density. That was one of the questions. Do they have the same density? Density is equal to the mass divided by the volume. So if you can measure the mass, not the weight, but the mass, and calculate the volume, then you can calculate the density. Difference between mass and volume, or mass and weight, is the effect of gravity. Um, that's all I have for you today. Thank you for joining me, and I hope to see you next time.
morning. My name is Stephanie Keeler, and I'm a science teacher here at Sequoia Mid-High High School. I teach physical science and zoology, so today I thought I would do a genetics lesson. Before I begin with the genetics lesson, I want to talk about the physical science kids this week because there's been a little confusion with the assignment that you have. The uh, physical science students are studying six simple machines. And so in physical science, the six simple machines are pulley, incline plane, wedge, screw, wheel and axle, and lever. Ooh, there it was close. What I need you to do is in your use those six simple machines as individual slides, define them, and then use your selfies from home of those examples of those six simple machines. Some people are just kind of coming up with their own simple machines, but there's actual like six simple machines in physical science. And those are the ones that I want you to use. If you have any other questions, please feel free to email me and I will answer those for you as best I can. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about genetics. Most of what I'm going to use for examples is human genetics because that's what I do in my classroom. But remember, all of this is going to relate to anything that has cells with DNA in it. When we uh, first started this, we did strawberry DNA and we extracted the DNA from a lot of cells. This is all just going to be the compilation of one cell's DNA and how does that affect you or the plant that has DNA or an animal that has DNA. So. When I usually teach this lesson, I started out by calling it, why do you look like that? Or why are you so funny looking? Just because I think it's hilarious. But one of the questions is, is these features or what gives my son these features? And the good news is if I ask you why you're so funny looking, it's not your fault, it's your parents' fault. Um, so this is a three generation picture of my family. And you can look and see there's some physical characteristics that are similar between us. And then there's some characteristics that you're like, I couldn't even tell that you were related maybe. Um, that applies to a bunch of different families. Why does one kid have blue eyes and another kid has brown eyes? Or why do my parents have brown hair and I ended up with blonde hair? It all goes back to genetics. So what we're gonna talk about first, there's a couple vocabulary terms in here that I wanna focus on, is a term phenotype, okay? The word phenotype is the way that you look. All right, phenotype, I always tell kids, think about the first two letters. It's your physical characteristics. And your phenotype is actually determined by two different things, your DNA, your genetic traits, and anything that makes you look the way you look that is not in your genetic code, we're gonna call environmental, okay? So my DNA that I inherited from my parents that give me my physical characteristics and then there's other things along the way that add to my physical characteristics that are not genetically inherited. So I'm going to start with this picture of Harry Potter and go through and what I would normally do is say give me a list of 10 things to describe what Harry Potter looks like and, and I give this picture in class and say okay what do you see? So the first thing that I would notice is that he has dark hair. Actually, probably the first thing I would notice is his scar from Voldemort. Uh, I'd notice that he has dark hair. You could talk about the texture of his hair. He's wearing glasses. But you can go to simple things, not just things that make him look different from me or from you, but also look at characteristics that make him different from a plant or your dog or a bacteria, okay? All of those are in your genetic code, okay? So I could say he's got two eyes, he has a nose, he has so many teeth, he has two arms. All those things go into his phenotype, okay? So then we're gonna break those down into what's genetic and what's environmental, okay? So when I look at his genetic code, his hair color, he inherited from James and Lily. Those are his parents, he inherited that from that, so that's a genetic trait. So maybe his hair texture, we could also talk about that. Is it curly hair or is it straight hair? That's a genetic trait, something he inherited from his parents. So when I look at Harry, what can you notice that's not genetic? What would be some of his environmental traits? You might mention his glasses. The physical glasses himself, wearing them, might be environmental, but the reason he needs his glasses might be genetic traits. Sometimes people wear glasses just because they're getting older like myself and their eye lenses are changing. It's kind of like getting gray hair as you get older. It's not a genetic trait. It's kind of like deterioration over time. We've used them really good. But sometimes when you're born young and you need glasses from an early age, it's actually a genetic trait that you inherited from your parents. The big one is probably his scar, okay? That's definitely an environmental trait. And the other thing you can do is look at it and say, am I passing this on to my kids? Did, did my parents have it 
or am I able to pass it on to my kids? So like I have a big scar on my arm from when I broke off the end of my elbow when I was a freshman. I didn't pass it on to my son. He didn't come out with a big giant scar on his arm. Um, some other environmental factors that uh, contribute to your phenotype can be uh, piercings, okay? Those don't pass on to your kids. Uh, tattoos are another environmental trait. They're, they're things that physically describe how you look. They're part of your phenotype, but they didn't come from your genetic code. And then I usually take the opportunity to say to kids, wouldn't it be funny if your environmental traits did pass on to your kids? So like the tattoos that your parents have, you have when you're born or your tattoos pass on to your kids and they usually have a lot to say about that. It's just funny to me. So what we're going to study today is how did we get those inherited traits, okay? And so what we're going to do, it says heredity includes the DNA that's received from each parent. I am not a carbon copy of my mom. I'm not a carbon copy of my dad. I have genetic information from both of them, okay? In the human karyotype, this is a picture of someone's DNA. There should be 46 chromosomes, okay? I get 23 from my mom, and I get 23 from my dad. And then the combination of those 46 chromosomes makes me look the way that I look. And I don't always get the same chromosomes from mom and dad that my siblings get, okay? So that can also change. There's just different combinations that you can receive. So when you look at this, I don't, I, you probably can't see from where you're at, but they're numbered. This is one, two, three, four, five. Every chromosome has particular genes located on it. So this chromosome right here, I'm going to advance this just for a second and then go back, is just a bunch of genes that are stuck together. And a gene is just a section of DNA that codes for one particular trait. So there's a gene for eye color, and there's a gene for hair color, and sometimes there's more than one gene. The interaction of those genes makes you look the way that you look. But in general, this is what they're saying here. So each one of these bands is supposed to represent a different trait that we're coding for. And this isn't an accurate one. It tells you at the bottom. It's just for an example. But this band right here might code for height. And this band right here might code for eye color. But when I physically link them all together, this whole big thing becomes a chromosome. And then I get 23 of those chromosomes from mom and 23 of those chromosomes from dad. What's interesting is that this might have, what, let's see that chromosome number one that we just showed. This little band right here might say eye color but it doesn't tell me what my eye color in particular is. Moms might say I get brown eyes and dads might say I get blue eyes or they might both say the same thing. So when we look at the karyotype, it's, it's kind of that piece of information. You have to have more technology to break that down. But what I can tell from the karyotype is that there's 46 chromosomes here, which is normal. Sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less, but you're gonna notice that in their phenotype. Um, the other thing that you may notice is that through these 23 pairs of chromosomes, it goes down here, 19, 20, 21, 22, and then for the 23rd set, they don't actually number it. They call it the sex chromosome. It's the XY series. And in all of these cases, they look pretty similar. This is uh, chromosome 13. They're about the same length, which is shorter than chromosome 2. Chromosome 21 is pretty short. But over here, we have a really long chromosome and a short chromosome. These are two different chromosomes. If you have the long one, which is an X, and the short one, which is a Y, that's going to be the genetic code for a boy. And if you're a girl, you actually have two X chromosomes there. So when you look at the karyotype, the first thing that you should be able to tell me is, does it have the correct number? count up the number of 46 chromosomes, but also you can look at the genetic code for gender. Uh, chromosomes here that are coding for the same traits are all called homologous. The prefix homo means same, so they're coding for the same traits. When you get down here, if you have an XY chromosome, they're not homologous anymore. The X chromosome will code for traits that the Y chromosome doesn't have. And so you'll see a lot of interesting genetic expression through that as well. Okay. So here's another picture of a karyotype. This is a diagram as opposed to a picture. That last one was a legitimate picture. Um, if you are pregnant, um, they can actually do an amniocentesis and take cells from the baby before it's born. It actually comes from the amniotic fluid. And you can create one of these karyotypes and know the gender of your child before it's born without the ultrasound. Or you can look if you have concerns about genetic 
malformations. And so you can go through and count them up. But again, each one of these little bars, it represents a different gene that codes for a trait that makes you look the way that you look. And then when you get down here, you'll notice if it's an X and a Y, a long one and a short one, it's a boy. And if you have two X's, then it's going to be a girl. Okay, so your gene traits that contribute to your phenotype are called your genotype, okay? And so when you look at that genotype, we're going to take away all the stuff that happened to me throughout my lifetime to make me look the way that I look. I'll take away the scar factor. If there's any tattoos, my piercings, those don't contribute to the genotype. The genotype is only the genetic code that I received from mom and dad. So each one of them will give me an allele. An allele is like a version of a gene. So I always tell kids, if you think about a gene as being a category, the allele is all the examples that you can have in that category. So a gene might be eye color. And then the alleles would be if I can have blue or green or brown or hazel. And so you can do the same thing with hair color. There's different forms of genes, and those are called alleles. So in this example for hair color, I have black, I have red, and I have blonde. There's also brown. There's other colors. And then again, remember, sometimes these genes aren't just one gene to code for it. It's multiple genes working to create your phenotype and what you look like. But allele just means what is the version of the gene that we have. Okay, so last new vocabulary, I think, is that your alleles can be dominant or they can be recessive. So the way this works is if I have a parent that says, Stephanie, you're going to have brown eyes, and then my other parent's genetic code says, you're going to have brown eyes, those two genes have the same alleles. And when you see that expressed, you're going to see in my phenotype that I have brown hair. You can also look at it for if it's another color. But what happens when you mix them together? There's a principle called the principle of dominance that says one allele should be dominant to another allele. And it doesn't work for every single situation, but this is the main course. There's always exceptions, but this is the main trend that you typically see. And so, for example, um, curly hair and straight hair are part of the genetic code. And so when I talk about them, curly hair is dominant to straight hair. So here's what's going to happen. I have, let me set this down for a second. I have a gene for curly hair from one parent, and I have a gene for curly hair from another parent. And I know you can't see it today because I straightened my hair, but I definitely have curly hair. Those two genes are saying the exact same thing. But if I had parents that said straight hair allele from mom, straight hair allele from dad, put those together, your child's going to end up with straight hair. But what happens if one parent gives an allele that says curly hair, and I have another parent that has an allele that says straight hair? Well, according to the principle of dominance, that curly hair is a dominant trait, and it will cover up or mask the recessive allele. So when I look at your phenotype, all I see is curly hair. But that recessive allele of straight hair is still there. It doesn't go away. We just mask it. We cover it up so that you can't see it in the phenotype. And so what's kind of interesting about that is if you have these masked alleles, when you pass on your genetic code to your kids, you can only pass on one. You can pass on that curly hair trait or you can pass on that straight hair gene. And if the kid gets straight hair, but you didn't have it, that's how that happens. You had a recessive allele that was masked that you had inherited from your parents, from the parents before that. So like my grandson has blue eyes. His parents don't have blue eyes. We don't have blue eyes, but his great grandpa has blue eyes. For three generations, for two generations, it was masked. It was covered up. And now in his generation, it's expressed. We get to see it. So I think that's kind of fun. It's like a puzzle to me. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to use, I'm going to try blue, and hopefully you can see it. The abbreviation code that they're going to use uh, in genetics is just to abbreviate it with one letter to show what's dominant and what's recessive. So in curly hair, it's dominant, and we'll use the first letter of the dominant trait. So whenever we want to write something for curly hair, we're going to put a capital C. Do we like the blue or do we like the green, Mr. Berg? Okay, so we're going to use a capital C for dominant, and then for showing that something is recessive, when I'm writing it down and taking notes, I'm going to use a lowercase c, and I usually tell kids to try and make it cursive so that it looks a little bit different. This little c means it's a recessive trait, which is straight hair. The capital C actually means that it's dominant, and then when you show those two together, we're only going to see the dominant trait in the phenotype. So that's kind of fun to see. All right. 
I need a tray, I guess. All right, so what I wanted to do today was kind of give you examples of things in your phenotype or may or may not be in your phenotype that are genetically controlled. And I picked out traits that are only two alleles. Because when you get into multiple alleles, more than two alleles, then there's a combination and it gets a little bit more, more difficult. So I thought, we'll just go with the simple ones today. It's either yes, you have it or no, you don't. And so what I would do on why are you so funny looking day is I would go through and I would pick out all these traits and have students write down, yes, I have them or no, I don't. And then you can kind of go back and learn the genetics behind them. So if you look at this picture, I don't know if you can tell the difference between these two pictures here, but right here, there's a nice little indention in his face, okay? Dimples are a genetic trait that is inherited from a parent, and dimples is a dominant trait. So what letter would I use to represent dimples? I'm gonna use a capital D to represent this guy over here with his dimples. This one doesn't have dimples, so I would put a lowercase d. Recessive trait, dominant trait, but it's all in their genetic code. Okay, by doing this presentation, I learned that there's actually like a dimple surgery, which kind of, but that's what it is. Okay, genetically it's there. All right, so John Travolta, good looking guy. His dimple is not right here in his cheeks. His dimple is right here in his, in his chin. Okay, the chin dimple is actually called a cleft chin, and it's a genetic trait that he inherited from a parent. It can be a mom or it can be a dad, but right here, this indention is called a cleft chin, and it's a dominant trait. So again, what letter would I use to represent this dominant trait? I'm going to use a capital C for John Travolta's chin. I don't have it, so I get a little C. Okay, it is a recessive trait for me. All right. Here's another one, and I noticed these things about people long before I learned about genetics, but I didn't understand that that was a genetic trait. So when you look at these ears, there's two different earlobes here. This is called detached or free earlobes, and this is attached earlobes. And the main difference here is when you follow the line of this ear, it's going to loop back up. There's actually an earlobe there, where this one, it just kind of goes straight down into the side. I have kids look at the kid next to them go, what do my earlobes look like? It's just not something we usually talk about. But do I have detached or do I have attached? Because they always had to tell me which genetic trait that they have. The detached earlobes is actually a dominant trait. So you could use a capital D, or if you called them free earlobes, you could use a capital F. And then over here, somebody that has the attached earlobes is going to be a lowercase d. And most of the time, girls know if they have attached or detached by their jewelry. Um, most of the time, guys are like, look at my face and tell me what's going on. All right. With Widow's peak. Widow's peak, I typically notice more in girls right away because they wear their ponytails. If they don't have bangs, you can see it right away. So with a widow's peak hairline, it's just pull your hair back and what does it look like? Some kids will have a line that kind of goes like this. And some kids, and it's not just kids, it's also adults, have more of a straight hairline there. It's a genetic trait that you inherited from a parent. Um, I can specifically remember my first year, this kid was absolutely horrified when they found out they had a widow's peak. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just the hair. The capital W tells me, is it dominant or recessive? It's got to be dominant, okay? And then over here, the straight hairline, this is the one I have. Use a cursive W to kind of tell the difference between them when we would write them out, but dominant trait versus recessive. I inherited these from my parents. So somebody has a widow's peak if you have a widow's peak. All right. <laughs> Hitchhiker's thumb. Hitchhiker's thumb, for the longest time, I always thought it was a dominant trait, but it's a recessive trait. Um, it always makes me laugh. Kids, kids will stick up their thumb and go, what do I have? Is this bent enough for hitchhiker's thumb or is it not? This is definitely a straight thumb. Um, and apparently it's very traumatic to me because I can still remember my eighth grade math teacher, Mrs. Idle, had the hitchhiker's thumb when she would teach math. It was my favorite subject, so I was always watching. But it's just a genetic code that she inherited from her parents. So regular thumb is actually dominant, so I would use a capital R here. And then my recessive allele over here would be a lowercase r. If you have hitchhiker's thumb, they gave it to you, okay? Now, what's interesting, though, if we go back to the rule of dominance for all of these, if you have two parents that don't have hitchhiker's thumb, and you do, it's because they had that masking. They had that recessive allele, and they had it covered up with that dominant trait. And so when they had to send one of those alleles to you to make you, they sent on that recessive allele. It's just kind of fun to think about. It's just a puzzle that you work backwards. Okay, 
rolling up the tongue. The tongue roll always makes me laugh as well because kids will instantly stick out their tongues unless they cannot. You already know which kids cannot roll their tongues. And it's not like they haven't learned how yet. It's not like tying your shoes. It's something that they physically can't do because they don't have the genetic code to do it. So when they talk about rolling up the, do the tongue, hot dog, okay, then everybody else wants to stick out their tongue. Look what else I can do. There's some kids that have, I can't do it or I'd show it to you, can do like a clover leaf with theirs. That's a different gene, but it's also a gene. It's just something interesting. You're like, tricks that you're teaching people. It's not, it's part of your genetic code. So rolling of the tongue is actually a dominant trait. My favorite show ever was Friends. There's a whole episode where they talk about rolling their tongues and not being able to. So if this kid cannot roll their tongue, are they capital or lowercase? They're lowercase because it's a recessive trait if you cannot roll your tongue. It's nothing you've done wrong and you're not gonna learn how to do it. You just don't have the genetic code to do it. And then there's a whole bunch more that we can go through. Um, this is another one. This one, usually I have kids that have to take their shoes off, but we try and do it in the spring so you're already wearing flip-flops anyway. Um, do you notice what's the difference between these feet? Okay, the difference here is called short big toe. Today I learned it's called Morton's toe as well. So if you're, big toe is shorter than the toe next to it, it's a genetic trait, okay? And over here, this is somebody, they can either be even or they can be longer than the toe next to it. Um, it always makes me laugh if somebody has a really short big toe because the other kids that go swimming with them already know. Look at, look at how much short the toe is, okay? I have big giant finger toes. It's a little bit different, but all of these are genetic traits that we've inherited from our parents. So it says here, everyone has two alleles, the one you got from mom and the one that you got from dad. And that works for all of our genes. It's how those genes are expressed in your phenotype that we're gonna see. And so here you can see in this particular mom, she has blue and green. And that blue and green is supposed to represent the allele she got from her parents. So that would be like the grandparents to you. So they got one from each parent. Over here, dad has red and purple to represent the alleles he got from his parents. So that's the other set of grandparents. And then all of that combines to make you. And it just depends how those combinations come out. There's a bunch of different factors. It's not like I inherit this whole entire gene from my mom. If I get this green particular chromosome, it actually goes through a step in meiosis called crossing over where you can get combinations of those, which is what this is supposed to represent. And so there's so many different combinations that you can get even if you have the same parents. But you get one from mom and one from dad if everything goes the way that it's supposed to in meiosis. And so like this is a picture of my family. My brother and I, even though I like to make fun of him, look very, very similar. You can see the genetic resemblance. I don't know if you can even see, this might be too dark, but my parents, we both have the same parents, Clearly, they did not same the same, send the same genetic code to us because one of us is a boy and one of us is a girl. So there's already that XY chromosome that's going to be different. But there's other characteristics that we have in common. We both have curly hair. We both have about the same color hair. We have about the same color eyes. And that goes back to what combination of alleles were available from our parents. Maybe they only had those combinations to send us, okay? Dad had bright red hair when he was young. Neither of us got that. We got the dominant trait of darker hair from my mom. Um, I have hazel colored eyes. I wanna say that Ryan does. He'll call me later and let me know if I am wrong. Um, and then that my mom has brown eyes and my dad has these cool like blue green eyes. So if you kind of look at mine, it's like a combination of the two, but it all came from back up the bus. How did all of these alleles combine to make this person down here. And then you take all these combinations and pass them on to my kids and pass them on to their kids and then just keep going. So the combination is what makes us genetically uh, indifferent, not indifferent, genetically unique. And we won't see that genetic cloning going on. The other thing that you're gonna notice is we're going back to the word phenotype. If we have genetically identical twins, they should have this code look exactly the same. And you, and you probably know genetically identical twins. We had three sets of twins in ninth grade this year, so you know some probably. They still will not phenotypically be exactly the same. I can constantly ask, how do you tell the difference between Carson and Caleb? And I can look at their genotype and I wouldn't be able to tell but environmental factors also contribute to it. And then there can also be changes in their DNA as they're developing. So all of that goes into, into your phenotype.
All right. And I think that's pretty much it. This is my cool family and this is me. Guys, I want to thank you for staying with us today and enjoying a session on genetics. Next week, we'll be back for our final week of RSU TV and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.